folks. We're going to start a few minutes late because there are some people still trying to park outside. Um, so we're going to probably start in about five minutes. Thank you.
He's got the book. He's got it. He's Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Nice to see you all here. Uh, my name is Joel Westfall, and it is my absolute honor to serve here as the Deputy Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. Before we start tonight's program, I would like to very quickly touch upon some of our future programming coming to the Ford Museum. First off is James Hornfisher, who will be here on April 17th. James is a very good friend of mine. Uh, when I worked uh, as the Archivist of the United States Navy at the Washington Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. Uh, James is widely regarded in his field, uh, and he I, I kind of call him the United States Navy's equivalent to Stephen Ambrose. Uh, many of his works are required reading at the Naval Academy. Uh, he will be here to talk about his book, The Fleet at Flood Tide, America at Total War in the Pacific. This program will be sponsored both by the Armed Forces Thanksgiving in Western Michigan, as well as our own uh, Ford Foundation. Following that, we will have David Priest on April 29th. He will be discussing his latest book, uh, New York Times bestseller, How to Get Rid of a President, History's Guide to Removing Unpopular, Unable, or Unfit Chief Executives. <laughs> we are also working... Uh, oh, we, are, we, are, we are all... Okay. We are... We are also working on a host of Ford After Five programs and been working very closely with Joe Calvaruso on these programs as well. Uh, we look forward, of course, to Jazz coming back to the museum as well as some fun, uh, fun folk, uh, programs on photography that will actually help you know, bring some folks in and maybe learn, learn a little about, about photography, maybe actually be able to take some photos. Uh, we're working on some really cool programs with that as well. And over at the library, um, we have uh, Secretary Carla Hills on May 14th. Uh, right now, uh, well, all I have is on her title of her lecture. It is called, what, Why Trade Matters. And we are really, really looking forward to the sec uh, Secretary Hills over at the library. She's been here many, many times, and we are really looking forward to having her at the library in Ann Arbor. Now on tonight, to tonight's program. The National Archives and Records Administration takes very, very, very great pride and hosting programs like this with its foundation partners. Our federal staff here at the museum, as well as at the library, are an important added value to the legacy and institution of the presidency and to the president's impact on our nation. Our curatorial staff here at the Ford, represented by our nationally respected curator, Don Holloway, and his team, which consists of the exhibit specialist, Bettina Cousineau, uh, registrar Jamie Draper, who's taking a photograph from you right now in the back, and uh, Travis Farrington, uh, one of the best, one of the better interns that we've ever had here at the museum, who really, really helped with the, with the exhibit upstairs. I would also like to thank our audiovisual archivist, uh, Elizabeth Druga, uh, in, assisting, uh, this, in assisting this team complete the project. Their service highlights the important mission the National Archives provides to the public, and I thank you very much for your, all, all of your hard work. I am constantly reminded by you, our visiting patrons, how lucky Grand Rapids is to have a presidential museum in it. Uh, it is a shining gem, which allows us to present public exhibits just like this one, which opened up today. Great historians and writers love a tra transition. Whether it is going from a paragraph to a paragraph, or whether it is going from chapter to chapter. In the case of the Ford Museum, we are transitioning from the beauty, the grace, the class that was Betty Ford, First Lady of the United States, to the artistic mastery of White House photographer David Hume Kennerly. Photographs and photography can do more to provide mere context to the written word. They can often bring an emotional response that words can do no justice to. It is my hope that when you look at the imagery upstairs, you will be transported to a different space and time and allow yourself to feel, through the lens of Mr. Kennerly, the happiness, togetherness, struggles, humanity, and integrity of the Ford presidency and of the Ford family. 
to kick off tonight's program and introduce our special guests, I would please like you to uh, welcome to the stage our valued partner, the Executive Director of the Ford Foundation, Mr. Joe Calvaruso. Thanks, Joel, and thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. This exhibit would certainly not be possible without our partners, the Fry Foundation and Bank of America. So thanks to each of them. Susan Ford Bales is the youngest of President and Mrs. Ford's children. Shortly after moving into the Weiss House in August of 1974, Mrs. Ford was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent extensive surgery. Susan suddenly was called upon at the age of 17 to fulfill her mother's duties as First Lady. She did so with grace and pride that was gratefully admired by her parents and the American people. In the years after the Ford presidency, Susan has continued her tireless champion of her parents' legacy. She has served as chairman of the Betty Ford Center and continues to serve on the board and executive committee of the Hazelton Betty Ford Foundation. Susan is a trustee of the Betty Ford's Charitable Trust, co-chair of President Ford's Historical Legacy Trust, and trustee and programs committee co-chair for her dad's foundation. Since 2006, Susan has served as the, sh the ship sponsor of the aircraft carrier USS Gerald R. Ford, CVN 78. In recognition of setting an unprecedented standard of commitment and excellence as a ship sponsor, and her deep devotion and inspiration into the, to the Ford crewmen, their families, and the Navy, Susan was named an honorary naval aviator. She is the only 31st honorary naval aviator, but even more impressive in what would certainly bring a smile to her mom's face. She is the first woman in history to receive this honor. In the early years of the Ford presidency, a young photographer loaned Susan a camera. He encouraged her to capture the images of her White House years. That camera was a spark to Susan. It led her to her lifelong passion as a photojournalist. And yes, you may have guessed that that camera was presented to Susan by our other very special guest tonight, David Hume Kennerly. David received the Pulitzer Prize for his extraordinary wartime phot photography in Vietnam. Several years later, he crossed paths with then Congressman Ford and later then Vice President Ford, and the friendship between them was almost instantaneous. On the very day President Ford was signed in, uh, sworn in as president, President Ford that night asked David to serve as the official White House photographer that appointment was the direct result of their friendship and President Ford's complete confidence in his friend's professionalism and integrity. David was given unprecedented public and private access to create the photographic history of the Ford presidency. No White House photographer before or since has received the access that David had with the President Ford and the Ford family. David's long and distinguished career has spanned over five centuries. It is stuff legends are made of. We at the President Ford Foundation are especially honored to have David as one of our trustees. Of course, sometimes people photographed by David are not aware they're in the presence of a Pulitzer Prize winning legend. One such moment occurred just before, uh, just out in front of the museum, a visit he made a couple years ago. He was sitting up in President Ford's office relaxing, and David noticed, and, and there's, in the spring and summer, it's just amazing, especially on Fridays, the wedding photographies and, and things that happen out here in front of the beautiful museum. David ra raced down to capture the moment when he saw a bride and groom getting their photography, their pictures taken out in front. How big a treat for a bride and groom than to have wedding pictures taken by the world famous photographer. David took a number of casual pictures and, and 
quietly went up to the bride and groom and asked for an email address. He says, I'd like to share these pictures with you that I've taken. The bride smiled and politely said, no thanks, we already have a photographer. <laughs> We're all set. Uh, so much for one of the most acclaimed photographers in the world. Uh, th thanks, it's an honor and a personal delight to welcome you to Grand Rapids, two special people, and in the lives of President and Mrs. Ford, two very special people, and two people I'm very proud to call friends. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Susan Ford Bales and David Hume Kennerly. I'm looking pretty good for 500. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. You made my day. Um, <laughs> I'm a, this somehow got, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scroll back in time here a second real quick. Oh, 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 there we go. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I'm glad you all turned out. I'm, um, this is a, a really big day for me. Um, and Don Holloway, uh, my co-conspirator on this uh, uh, exhibit, it, to see it up like uh, yesterday when I did a walkthrough, uh, it's not the same as just seeing a schematic. And uh, all of a sudden, there the pictures are up on the wall. And uh, I'm going to take a few people there. I, I wrote them down this time because I'm I'm sorry, Elaine Didier's not here. She was the director of the uh, um, museum and presidential uh, library. Uh, she's had a few health problems, and uh, I'm going to give her a call. John Muller is here. John, are, uh, John, John's company made all these prints and did all the framing. And uh, so if you have work you need done in Los Angeles, uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's a, uh, he's the, he's your man. Um, my old friend Ken Hafley is here. Uh, Ken uh, was uh, how many years as the uh, photo archivist? Uh, wow, he he knew my archive better than anybody. And uh, I'd call Ken and I'd say, God, there was this meeting in uh, Vladivostok, and uh, President Ford was like talking to Brezhnev on the train. Oh yeah, that's. Uh, a4283, frame 16. I mean, uh, unbelievable. And Elizabeth Druga is like taking over for him. And uh, uh, Elizabeth, I don't bug often enough, and I'll, I'll take care of that. Um, and two uh, um, who have become great friends, uh, Ann Breckenridge Barrett, who's the director of the Center for Creative Photography in uh, Arizona. Uh, and um, Meg Hagyard, who's also out there, and they're sitting together. They, um, the president of the University of Arizona, Dr. Robert Robbins, Bobby, to his friends, uh, who's a surgeon, used to run the Houston Medical Center, which is a, a huge operation, um, is named me a, a presidential scholar, uh, the first one ever, which means I'm going to be working with the uh, University of Arizona and the Center for Creative Photography, where, which is the home of the Ansel Adams Archive. Uh, Susan Ford uh, was a student of Ansel's and uh, attended the uh, uh, Ansel Adams workshop. Uh, I photographed Ansel, well, uh, first I met him uh, as the White House photographer, invited him in, and he sat down with Susan's dad and gave him this incredible lecture on the environment. And about halfway through, uh, President Ford said, well, wait, Ansel, I, I'm not the enemy. I used to be a park ranger at Yellowstone. I loved the environment and the parks. And, <clears throat> and because of that meeting, um, and I gave a lecture at the University of Arizona at the Center for Creative Photography about Ansel Adams and his relationship with Gerald R. Ford. It was a story nobody really knew. And uh, that because of their friendship and letters they exchanged and uh, uh, about the national parks, 
President Ford, during the election year of 1976, submitted a, a multi-million dollar budget to expand the National Park Service by twice as much as it was. And, uh, and the Democratic Congress shot it down, which is, uh, was really, a, to me, a major tragedy. And, and it, your, your dad got so mad that one of his last acts before he left the White House was he submitted it again to Congress. He also recommended to uh, Jimmy Carter that uh, Ansel be given the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And Mrs. Ford and uh, the President signed a letter to, for Carter, and he did uh, present him with that in the, in the uh, uh, Rose Garden. Randa Cardwell, raise your hand. Randa is uh, <clears throat> our archivist, has helped uh, like over the last uh, few years. Uh, Rebecca found her as a, a student at UCLA. You're on your third career, is it? Fourth career, yes. And uh, uh, she is a photo archivist who graduated with a master's degree at UCLA. And Rebecca found her, and she's become part of our photo family and very much a part of our family. And she's here. Uh, the Bank of America, Renee and MJ, are you here? No. Oh, we uh, Anyway, Bank of America was uh, responsible for sponsoring uh, the, all the, everything around these events. They contributed money to the, the Ford Foundation. Uh, I do a lot of work with them. Uh, I've had a 10-year relationship. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about some of all this. All right. And Susan, now it's over to you for the rest of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, by the way, the Extraordinary Circumstances uh, book, which uh, unfortunately is out of print, um, was... Uh, taken the name, it was taken right out of uh, Gerald Ford's uh, speech upon uh, remarks upon becoming president of the United States um, August 9th of 1974. And he said, I, I come to this job uh, under extraordinary circumstances. The, he became vice president. Well, I'm going to, I'll just give a quick readout. Uh, Richard Nixon was under siege. Uh, when I came back from Vietnam in 1973, uh, Watergate was percolating. Uh, the story really had shifted for me from uh, Vietnam to, to the U.S., and I, I immediately started covering the Nixon administration. Uh, but the big one for me was uh, meeting Pres uh, Gerald R. Ford, minority leader of the, uh, of the Congress. He was under consideration to be uh, replacing Spiro Agnew, who had resigned as the vice president. And I took this picture of him in his office. And uh, I guess later the next day, he was announced to be the, uh, the vice president uh, of Richard Nixon. This is my first time cover and his first time cover. Uh, a photo note on this. Um, I took the picture in his office uh, up uh, uh, in the US Capitol building. And um, I refer to this as Rembrandt lighting, meaning it's just a window. Yeah, which is the way Rembrandt used to paint. And um, the, I, this was probably one of the most important pictures I ever took uh, because it did lead to another thing with uh, uh, Richard Nixon resigning. This is on the South Lawn at the White House. And um, uh, on August 9th, this sequence uh, was made as Nixon got on the helicopter to leave. And this detail, these are the first two frames when he got up on the uh, helicopter steps and looked back toward the White House. And I will enlarge that further. But this is a very profound and sad moment for him, certainly, and for the United States of America. This is a, a real low point in our history, I think. Uh, and at, from his point of view, he's looking at the White House right there, knowing that he's the only president uh, to that point in sense to resign uh, office. And um, uh, I, I, I keep coming back to this picture as a, in a way as a haunting image of uh, a huge event in American history, probably the top five for me. But this is what led Susan Ford and uh, her dad into the White House. And this is an early photograph 
uh, of President Ford in the uh, Oval Office with the empty shelves in the background, all the Nixon stuff had been taken out. And um, the previous night, President Ford had offered me this job at their home in Alexandria. And um, I had not been too sure I wanted to do it because Richard Nixon's photographer had no access and I didn't want to sit outside the Oval Office waiting for somebody to tell me I could go in or not go in. So he said, if, asked me if I was interested in the job and I said, I would if I could report directly to you and have access to everything in the White House that was going on. And he was smoking his pipe and he quit smoking and all I could think of was I got to call my parents up and tell them the President of the United States offered me a job and I told them to shove it. <laughs> um, and he started laughing and said, you don't want Air Force One on the weekends. And uh, from that, it all worked out. <laughs> so, um, and now we segue to that same house and this is Susan Ford having breakfast with her dad. Uh, the Fords lived in their place in Alexandria for 10 days. Uh, and President Ford com commuted every day to the White House because you know, the abrupt transition meant that the Nixons had not, uh, their things hadn't been taken out. And so all that was going on. And Susan, uh, I'm going to stop talking. And you could ta talk about that time, which is shocking for everybody. I well, think. it really was a shocking time because, of course, it had never happened before. Um, my parents had built this home in Alexandria, Virginia, and um, that was our dining room kitchen table. I mean, that's where we spent a lot of time and a lot of meals. And uh, was in the room? No, I have no idea what happened to that table. It, it made it to the California house, and when we sold the California house, I don't know where it went from there. So um, none of us kids wanted it, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> So it went somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, it was just, it was so strange because here your dad is, President of the United States, but you're still living in the same house you grew up. I mean, that's the house I went home to from the hospital. It's the only house I ever knew until I moved to the White House. And uh, you're still there, and there's no butlers or cooks or any but thing. You're still taking care of yourself. I hate when that happens. I know, me too. <laughs> So, to me, the most exciting part of the White House was I was getting my own bedroom and bathroom and not having to share with my brothers anymore, so. Okay, let's move out of Crown View Drive. Uh, this is in the White House, and uh, uh, by the way, most of these pictures will be in this exhibition, not everything, but uh, 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 when President Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, he walked down the hallway and uh, was taking calls from various members of Congress who said they thought he'd done the right thing, but they were going to beat him up for it publicly. Uh, and here he is under a portrait of Nixon and his vice presidential uh, portrait. The man on the left was Jack Marsh, who recently passed away. It was really one of the great people of all times. It was uh, uh, the president's White House counselor, lawyer, former congressman from Virginia former Secretary of the Army later. And uh, uh, there was a story about Jack, uh, by the way, that I didn't know. And, uh, I, I read it when, in his obituary. When he was a congressman, he wanted to see, during the Vietnam War, he wanted to find out what was going on uh, out on the ground in, in Vietnam. He went out and he deployed with some uh, soldiers in the field under fire and never told anybody that he was a congressman, that he was out, uh, and, and I, I wish I'd known that. I would have liked to have talked to him about it, but uh, he was a great man, and uh, Al Haig's back to us, and uh, Bill Timmons, and uh, Bob Hartman on the left. But th this was uh, the day where President Ford lost his popularity, and I, uh, he even believed that uh, ultimately that that's what cost him the election when he decided to run. And um, uh, and that led to this moment where Gerald R. Ford was the first president since, uh, before and since uh, Abraham Lincoln to testify before Congress. And he, he decided to go up voluntarily 
Uh, they had asked him if he would want to do it. It was a Democrat uh, majority. And he sat there and answered every question about the pardon in order to put to rest rumors that he'd made a deal or there had been something untoward about it. Um, and that was a really brave act, I thought. I mean, he was a really brave guy anyway. Uh, um, but the kind of integrity and honesty to face the American people through our elected representatives to talk about what was a, a really a devastating blow to him uh, uh, politically. And uh, uh, I, I, this picture is really big in the exhibition. There are a few uh, uh, particularly large ones. And for some reason, I, I, I don't think uh, this one is published, uh, but um, uh, particularly on what's happened the last couple of days by a president who wouldn't be deposed by the special prosecutor, and I understand that, but uh, uh, the, this man had the, uh, uh, the guts to face the American people and all these difficult questions about the pardon. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, this is my Columbo photo, if any of you remember. Uh, <laughs> This plane, by the way, was the, uh, the Air Force One for uh, uh, every president from um, uh, Richard Nixon through to Bush 41 before he got the 747. And that plane, uh, if any of you, of you are at uh, Simi Valley, the Reagan Library, the plane's in the library in a whole big atrium. It's a really impressive uh, sight. Uh, all I can think about when I went in to visit, uh, it's like when you were a kid. Uh, you know, walk on the place and well, this is way smaller than I remember. <laughs> it's a very bizarre feeling. And this is Susan and me, and Susan can tell you about uh, why she was dressed up with that outfit. Uh, this is in the Rose Garden outside the White House. and uh, Obviously spring in Washington with the tulips blooming. Uh, I was uh, Queen Shenandoah Apple Blossom and <laughs> from Jack Marsh's district in Winchester, Virginia. Um, so anyway, um, I needed some pictures taken of me in my queen dress, and uh, Albert Caprero designed that dress, uh, who was one of Mother's designers. And so David, I guess, got the privilege of, you could tell we weren't being very serious. I still have that tie, actually. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's this one. Yeah. It like... <laughs> Well, I like that because uh, Susan and I and uh, all, all the kids, uh, for one thing, I was just a little bit older than Mike, uh, like by three or four years. And so, uh, you know, I, I was treated as if I were a member of the family by the Fords. And, uh, um, and you were just as obnoxious as the other of Exactly. <laughs> well, we'll move along now. <laughs> Uh, this is, <laughs> and it's uh, stuck. <laughs> you should talk about this moment. Uh, uh, this is Mrs. Ford showing the uh, Lady Bird Johnson, Linda Bird, and uh, and um, Lucy Lucy Baines, and uh, and, and there's Susan on the far right. This is in the Ford's private bedroom in the on the second floor of the White House. And uh, tell them what's going on here because this is a really big day and a scary day actually for them well mother and mother and dad and you were with them earlier in the day had been over at the dedication of the lady bird johnson wildflower or something on the parkway in in dc and um so mother invited the johnsons which is what you normally do when there's former white house uh residents in town invite them to come over for tea or and to see the house and whatever so mother had invited them over, but the day before this, mother had been diagnosed with a breast cancer. And so what most people don't see is the suitcase sitting at the foot of their bed. Once again, um, first ladies and presidents before them did not share a bedroom. And this was the first lady's bedroom and the other room, which they turned into a den, uh, was the president's bedroom. And my mother said, well, Jerry and I have slept together in the same bed for however many years it was, and we're going to continue to. And, you know, that's the way it was. But anyway, her suitcase was packed because as soon as the Johnsons left, mother headed to Bethesda Naval Hospital to check in, and then we released it that 
um, she was going to have uh, a breast biopsy because back then you didn't know if you were going to wake up with a Band-Aid or the next day with a, your breast gone. Things have changed drastically for the good since then. So it was uh, a, a very hard day for all of us. And Mrs. Ford didn't tell the Johnsons <clears throat> that she was about ready to go to the hospital. And so the, her bag there was packed up and ready to go. And I, I found that photo when I was doing the book. And I, I, it was really one of those moments where, like, all this other stuff was going on, and there's the bag. And, then, and I knew what it meant, but uh, nobody else did. And I, uh, um, this photo was in the, I believe this was in the exhibition, too. Um, but another element to that was that Mrs. Ford... Uh, over not objection of her staff, but her staff encouraged her or at least advised her that she didn't have to talk about breast cancer, did not have to talk about why she was going into the hospital or afterwards. And she said, no, this is, uh, to me, the first of uh, uh, an heroic act on her part. She felt that women should know about uh, breast cancer because uh, nobody was talking about it and particularly a first lady of the United States who was diagnosed and had the operation and all that and she stood up and uh, told everybody what was going on. President Ford stood beside her. Uh, that led to thousands of women getting uh, examinations including Happy Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller's uh, wife, uh, the vice president's wife who was uh, discovered to have breast cancer, and uh, she credits Mrs. Ford with saving her life. Um, and of course, later on, talk about drug and alcohol abuse and uh, the Betty Ford Center and all of that. But uh, this was act one of, of, of that. Um, oops, there we go. And uh, Joe mentioned that uh, uh, Susan filled in for her mom uh, who was in the hospital. This is a pre-scheduled white tie uh, event. And uh, talk about what that was. Well, this was, was a White House dipl diplomatic corps. And I guess, I don't know if it's every year or every administration you have this. Not anymore, no. Um, you have this reception where you invite the entire diplomatic corps, which is all the ambassadors from all the different countries, over for, I, I guess it's dessert and what, dancing and whatever. Um, and so my mother was in it was in Bethesda Naval Hospital. She had, had just not she had had her surgery. I don't know how she was there for a week. So this was within that week. So um, I got to fill in for her, and I was 17, um, and uh, never worn long white gloves before. So my mother said, you know, loan me hers. She told me where they were in her dresser, and so we uh, I got a long that was a red chiffon dress. Um, and got all dressed up and spent the evening meeting ambassadors and their wives and, and dancing with ambassadors and their wives, which, of course, they didn't dance like I did because I was 17. And <laughs> so it, it was an interesting evening, but it was, it was a pleasure to fill in for her and, and do something like that for her. All, all under the watchful eye of Martha Washington, whose portrait is in the background. <clears throat> this is in the East Room of the uh, White House which is where they have dances and uh, the entertainment after a state dinner, which would have been down at the other end of the hall. Um, oops, sorry. This thing is hair triggered. And this is a great example of that relationship between uh, Susan and Mrs. Ford. And part of my documentation of history is really about relationships. And because like, no one else is in the room except me. And a lot of times you read stories like uh, President or, or uh, Ambassador Bush met with President Ford to talk about the CIA directorship, and there only the two of them were in the room, uh, and David Kennerly. But the, nobody ever mentions that. I said, how'd that picture get taken anyway? You know, uh, yes, I knew what was going on. Uh, but this is Dad's chair in the Oval Office, and Susan and and Mrs. Ford who had. Uh, really one of the great relationships. I, I mean, for me, uh, uh, because I love both of them, but uh, uh, to be able to take a picture like this in a candid moment where they're just you know, messing around 
But uh, talk a little bit about the, some of the things your mom did in the, in the pranking uh, category. My mother was really a prankster. Um, and a lot of people didn't see that in her. I mean, they saw the more dignified, you know, type person. But she really was a prankster. I, and I guess you kind of have no choice when you got three boys and, you know, that's kind of what happens. When we were growing up, if, if my mother wasn't in the emergency room with one of the boys every week, they thought something was wrong at the Ford house. So, um, for instance, my last night in the White House before I left to, to move to Kansas, um, I decided to spend the night in the Lincoln bedroom. And so in the morning, I went, you know, why not? And I, I wanted to see the ghost just like everybody else had heard about the Lincoln bedroom. And so that morning, my mother came walking in with a sheet draped over and going, ooh. <laughs> Um, but she, she was a prankster and, and David will tell you, she also loved a good dirty joke. So, um, and David What's probably had more dirty jokes to tell than I did. So, well, uh, in fact, when I had an off color joke and, uh, I really would never tell the president cause a, he wouldn't get it normally or, 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 or he would have been like offended. So, uh, I would always, Mrs. Ford wanted to hear all of that, she wanted to hear gossip about who was doing what with whom. And uh, uh, it, she was really, um, uh, to this day, certainly one of the favorite people in my life. And uh, uh, to be able to photograph her and the, and the family in the White House. And I think when you're walking through uh, the exhibit, uh, uh, have you seen it yet or you, you just came in here? I, I hopefully it'll be open this evening, but uh, oh, good. Okay, well, hallway, you make sure, right? Because they don't all want to come just listen to us. You got to see some of the photos. Uh, moving along, this um, we're kind of ping ponging around a little bit here, but this is President Ford working on an economic speech. Uh, when I showed this picture to Alan Greenspan on the right, who uh, President Ford appointed as uh, economic advisor at that time. He said, as usual, I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> now, Alan Greenspan, by the way, is a, a, a truly funny guy. He used to play the uh, clarinet or the saxophone. He was yeah. like a jazz player, uh, things you don't know about Greenspan. But next to President Ford is Donald Rumsfeld as chief of staff. And then the guy partially blocked off putting the cigarette out on the president's desk in an ashtray is Dick Cheney. And as Susan pointed out earlier, everybody smoked then. In fact, in the exhibition, <clears throat> you'll see some um, Air Force One cigarettes. And I remember when I was in Vietnam, uh, to give you some idea of the strength of the tobacco lobby, uh, every sea rat package had a, a little pack of cigarettes in it. So uh, uh, the US military was also complicit in uh, um, perpetuating probably one of the worst things you could do to yourself in your life. And uh, <clears throat> Dick Cheney had heart problems. Uh, uh, I don't know if they were caused by smoking or not, but I'm pretty sure that didn't help. Um, this is the photo that kept President Ford off the best dress list. Uh, wasn't going to make GQ with this one. And Mrs. Ford always used to give him a hard time. Remember that he had a bathrobe she tried to keep throwing out, and he would retrieve it out of the garbage can. And uh, uh, a depression boy. I know, I know he was. And uh, uh, and she, when she saw this picture, she said, "Oh my God, stripes and plaid." Uh, <laughs> yeah, but there's Donald Rumsfeld on the right as chief of staff, and uh, Terry O'Donnell and the military aide. And this is an early morning meeting. This was not a, obviously a public thing, but this, this picture gives you an idea of uh, not only my access, which was kind of a given, but uh, the fact that President Ford uh, never said, now you can't take a picture of this. I mean, he wasn't kind of following me around. Like I photographed every president since Nixon uh, through the current uh, person. And um, uh, that, all of them have a different way of reacting. Like Bill Clinton, where you'd be in the Oval Office and you could see his eye just following you around, like where you were going. And um, But President Ford was like, whatever you want to do, he never said I didn't like that picture or don't take it. 
uh, LBJ had a, uh, according to Yochi Okamoto, who was his uh, uh, White House photographer, had a, um, uh, wouldn't even sign a picture if he didn't like the way he looked in it. And so President Ford didn't care, which made my life a lot easier. And um, that that picture had been published, and uh, some people said, how, how in the hell did he let you do that? I said, because he doesn't care. You know, he lets me do my own thing. Um, another, yeah, no, uh, we'll get back to liberty. <laughs> you can talk about, you got to tell that one story. But, but just because, like, you know, there's so much talk about the media being enemy of the people and all this bullshit, you know, now. But I, I excuse my French, but um, I am, President Ford understood the First Amendment. He understood the, 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 the value of the press, even though they drove him crazy and he didn't like, certainly didn't like everything they were writing about him. I mean, of course. I mean, the press doesn't write and say, oh, he, President Ford did another really great thing today, you know, and that's just not how it goes. But what's important about this photo is um, uh, this is the transition in the media from video to, from film to video. You see the old film cameras with the kind of Mickey Mouse ears, uh, uh, reels, and there are two video cameras in there. And this was the moment, uh, moment, but let's just say within about a three month period where we went from film to all video, and it really changed everything in terms of uh, press coverage. But President Ford, would not, uh, uh, he always was interested in what uh, people were doing and you know, the people in the press corps, but he, during his press conferences, he would always call on this reporter from a little paper in Texas who would ask the most off the wall, weirdest questions. And his press secretary one time said, well, Mr. President, you don't have to call on her in this Press, and at these press conferences, there's no law that says you've got to do it. And he said, why, why do you do it? He said, I just can't wait to hear what she's going to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but he, he was, uh, uh, like, as a member of the press, and like, uh, uh, as someone who's had dozens of my friends killed in action trying to tell the story and the truth, uh, I, I, you know, I really appreciated his sense of humor about it, but, but really his dedication to the Constitution. And there was a, a perfect example of that is when he came into Austria uh, to meet Sadat and he uh, tripped and he fell down the stairs. And it was an incredibly embarrassing thing. I mean, you, any of you know, if you walk into a room and you trip, even if there's maybe only two or three people around to see it, uh, that's a, uh, you know, that's not fun. But this is in front of the world's press, and uh, um, and I'm at the foot of the ramp, and I'm I have I'm holding my arm up like this, but I'm shooting a picture, <laughs> like uh, that's just the way I am. But uh, uh, so afterwards, somebody asked him. I said, "Well, aren't you mad about the press people? Because in the current situation, ever the press would be blamed for everything." And uh, and he said, and he was not only not mad at the photographers for doing it or resentful, he said, look, that's their job. I, I, I fell down, you know, unfortunately, they took the picture. If they'd missed it, they might have lost their job. So that was him in a nutshell about how he felt about that. Uh, okay, Liberty. Liberty. And the, we never know about this, whether she didn't want to look at the pants or she loved me. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I'm not sure. I think it was love, you know, but this is Liberty and Susan will tell you of the background because I, I didn't I didn't know before that you'd had those uh, golden retrievers. So Well, we, we had always had golden retrievers and we had lost our golden retriever when dad was vice president. And um, so David and I began this search to get mother and dad a new dog. Because, you know, you've got to have a dog. We, we had always had dogs in the house. So, um, so David and I began this search, and we wanted to find a older dog. And I don't mean old. I mean not a little 12-week-old puppy, because who's going to housebreak a puppy at the White House? So Liberty, yeah, right. was it? not at ours. 
Um, so Liberty was six months old when we got her. She was already housebroken. She was pretty much trained um, to sit and stay and, and do the basics. But David, in talking to this breeder, and we have a mixed uh, disagreement about where Liberty came from. Um, anyway, David talked to the breeder, and the questions that the breeder asked David was, well, do these people, because he, he didn't want to tell them where the dog was going. And so uh, they said, well, do they own or do they rent their house? And, and <laughs> David, being the smart ass that he is, you know, said, well, it's public housing. <laughs> and it's the truth. Um, and, and then it was, well, is the yard fenced? Well, yes. So David finally, because she wasn't going to release this dog to wasn't going to sell it to us because we, we bought the dog. Um, and so David had to divulge to the breeder where the dog was going and that sort of thing. And so she brought her. And we gave liberty to dad when mother was in Bethesda Naval Hospital so mother couldn't turn it down or send it away. There was, <laughs> there was a lot of thought involved in this. So anyway, liberty became very much a part of the family and went to, went to the office with dad almost every day. Um, and there, there was also the story of one night when Liberty wanted to go out in the middle of the night, which was unusual. She must have been pregnant then. And so my dad got up in his striped pajamas and his plaid robe and took her out to the South Lawn. And back in those days, when you went out, the doors locked at the White House. And <laughs> dad literally got locked out of the White House. <laughs> There's a lot of liberty stories. But a lot of liberty it. stories, and <clears throat> and unselfishly, I wanted a dog in the White House also because uh, you can't beat little kids and dogs for like great photographs. And uh, because there weren't any little kids around, uh, Liberty uh, fit the bill. Somebody told me there was a, was a Joe. Somebody about the the most the the photo people like the best is a, a picture of President Ford and Liberty in the Oval Office. Not that one, but uh, but, but she was everywhere. She She's was a great dog. Camp David on Air Force One. Uh, probably should have done a book about Liberty. Okay, where are we? Um, this was a, a, a genuine moment with Tip O'Neill was at the time the minority leader, majority leader of the uh, House. Uh, he and President Ford had been uh, counterparts on the other side of the aisle. And really, uh, it underscores a major point, which is uh, you can kick each other around politically, but you don't make personal attacks on people. I never heard either of those guys talk about the other one in a personal way. They disagreed politically. It, it's the system. It's the way it should work. And... Um, uh, they would have like uh, dust ups politically during the week and play golf on the weekends and a lot. And they were, I think, truly good friends. Uh, same with when Tip O'Neill became speaker with him and Ronald Reagan. Uh, the whole social security revamp was done because it was the Greenspan Commission during Reagan where uh, O'Neill and Reagan like horse traded on various things to do, but they saved the social security system. And um, they did it because they could talk to each other and nobody was trying to ram something down the other one's throat. And both uh, President Ford and Reagan had that relationship. And I really miss those days. I mean, uh, uh, the American political system has been, for, from the get-go, it's been a raucous, crazy, you know, free-for-all uh, kind of system, but when it succeeded, it's been because people can talk to each other. That's just not the case now, and, and it works. Uh, it's not working properly, and it's really, it's too bad. These guys were great examples of how that could be. And this is a photograph I took. It, I, I show this because uh, this is in the exhibit. President Ford sent me um, on a mission, I, I wanted to go with Fred Wyand, General Frederick Wyand, who was a four-star general, chief of staff of the Army, to go to Vietnam to see if uh, anything could be done to stem the tide of the North Vietnamese who had attacked over the DMZ. And um, 
went to Saigon. I flew up to Da Nang. I was in Nha Trang when it uh, was evacuated. Um, I then flew over to Cambodia, which is where this photograph was taken. Um, a week before it fell to Khmer Rouge, it was really a dicey trip. The CIA flew me in there, and the guy wouldn't even stop the plane. You know, I had to jump out uh, uh, because there was so much fire. <laughs> I took one, uh, and uh, and I <clears throat> I was met by Matt Frangiola, who was an AP guy, who was in Phnom Penh, and he took me around. And then I had a classified briefing at the embassy in Phnom Penh, where uh, there was a, a a big map in the in the um, in their situation room, and Nam Pen was in the middle, and all these red arrows were pointing <laughs> at it. And I, I told the ambassador, I said, I looked at my watch. I said, Well, listen, I got to run, uh, <laughs> but the place was evacuated later. But I came back and showed President Ford these photos, and I and I uh, this was a really emotional, difficult situation for me because I'd been in Vietnam for over two years uh, as a combat photographer, and I, but I had a lot of Vietnamese friends. They were terrified. They wanted to figure, try to figure out how they could get out of there. And um, uh, so I gave him a briefing, really, that was unlike anything he had. The, the generals were not saying that this was winnable, but they were suggesting perhaps there could be a, a zone around Saigon and... Uh, it was you know, wishful thinking. I told the president that uh, we were in Palm Springs, actually, uh, that I thought Vietnam had three or four weeks left, uh, and I'd been out in the field, and I saw what was going on, and uh, uh, <clears throat> as it turned out, it folded uh, three and a half weeks later. Um, but these photos... Uh, of refugees and all the people I, I put up on the White House walls. And then someone during the night took them all down. They were so offended that these photos went up that the President of the United States got really pissed off and, and ordered that they be put back up. The other thing that it did uh, was it convinced President Ford that he should keep the doors open for more uh, Vietnamese refugees, there were a lot of uh, officials who wanted to um, just get the Americans out, and that was it. Uh, President Ford said, no, uh, we owe uh, the people who fought alongside us, uh, particularly those who work with the CIA, like really high-risk jobs, uh, to, to, to come out. And so President Ford was responsible ultimately for over a quarter of a million refugees uh, being allowed, uh, getting them out, and then... Uh, getting them into the United States. And if any of you have Vietnamese friends here, Orange County and Texas, wherever, um, they have proved to be some of the best citizens we have. And this underscores the power of photography. This brought the war right into the Oval Office, not just a bunch of reports about this is happening and that's happening. These were real people. Um, and I, it was... Uh, uh, it was probably one of the most satisfying things I ever did when I was in the in the White House. Uh, this is the decision uh, was being made to pull out uh, right toward the end. And th th this is a ultra top secret meeting. The head of the CIA, the Deputy Secretary of State, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Deputy Vice President, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I'm in there now. This is under a portrait of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, where, and no one's speaking. I mean, it's like an ironic moment. It was like a, a, a to be in the room where I've been in when wars have started, and I've been in the room when wars ended. And it's it's part of what makes me tick. That's why I do it. And it's a documenting history and being able to be there, which is really important. Um, and Ronald Reagan. Uh, ran against President Ford in 1976. And a lot of these, some of these pictures are in the exhibit, some aren't, they, these are. But this was after Ford beat Reagan at the uh, 1976 uh, convention. You were out there. Kansas City. Kansas City. And um, uh, so the deal was that uh, the winner would go to the loser's hotel, in this case, Reagan, ultra thin margin. He barely beat uh, Reagan in this, and 
and, and, and President Ford was not happy that Reagan had run against him, fellow Republican, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can see that here, actually. And this is a real genuine moment. What happened next was they went out and had a joint press conference. So this is what I saw, this is what you saw. <laughs> So there is politics in a nutshell. <laughs> and uh, this is here in Grand Rapids. And were you, th you weren't there. This is, uh, this mural, uh, there's a uh, smaller version of it upstairs here, but. Uh, it's at it, the airport. Yeah, and I think it's in storage right now. They're rehabbing the airport. But this was the dedication of the mural, and your dad was talking about um, his, uh, Gerald R. Ford Sr. and your uh, grandmother. And this was one of the single most emotional moments uh, during the Ford presidency outside of when your mom went in the hospital and uh, how he was reacting. But uh, everybody, including the press corps, he was talking about them and, what, and you could see it in his face about uh, what they meant, what they meant. I mean, uh, Gerald Ford Sr., uh, he always considered to be his real dad. And I, and I think, I don't think people, a lot of people know that your dad's original name was Leslie King, and... Uh, they do in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're smarter out here than the rest of the country. I mean, I'm pretty sure of that. But, uh, uh, but he, he looked at, at Gerald Ford Sr. as his dad. He was the guy that raised him. He, uh, and, and there are pictures of him on or the, uh, part of the painting had him in there and, and the press corps was weeping. Everybody was weeping about it. It was one of the most powerful moments ever. And it was, this is right after he voted in the 76 campaign. It was a tough campaign. And he uh, voted here, then flew back to uh, Washington, D.C. What, where were you that night? Were you? I was registered in Virginia. I'm a Virginian. <laughs> that actually, but it was the first election I ever voted in. It was? Uh-huh. Yes, David. <laughs> and then carrying on, and, I, and Susan could pick it up from here because th this was really a tough day. Uh, it was uh, actually, I think, the closest election up until the Bush Gore debacle. But um, uh, so this is in the Oval Office. Uh, uh, is this before the press conference or after the press conference? Uh, before, right okay. before. Okay. And so. Uh, uh, I was in there when President Ford had been campaigning the, the, really all out for the last two weeks. He'd lost his voice. He could barely talk. And so uh, the, the concession to Jimmy Carter, uh, uh, he was in the Oval Office and Cheney was in there. I think Jack Marsh was in there. Um, and uh, they called Carter up and he officially conceded the election to him and um, wanted to read him the statement that uh, he was going to give through uh, Susan's mom. Uh, but Dick Cheney read it to him because Ford's voice was gone. And uh, I have the pictures of that. And then the family came in and uh, uh, this is, you know, nobody feeling good here. This is a really bad moment with Susan. Why, why don't you talk about uh, what you went through? At that I mean, it was, uh, we'd, we'd all been up the night before till 2, 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning, and everybody's on no sleep. I mean, I can just look at the circles under my dad's eyes, and we all had cried a lot, and we are sad. I and mean, it was a very sad day. So, uh, Terry O'Donnell. Right, and then there was a, um, the, I don't know if this picture is there, but there's one of the whole family behind the desk in the Oval Office, which kind of replicated when uh, the day he became president. Uh, not a, it was a photo Ollie Atkins took, I think. Uh, but really, one of the, and, and the, this is in, as you go into the exhibit, you'll see this picture, this picture of, whoop, we'll go back, this photograph of uh, Terry O'Donnell. O'Donnell and I, uh, outside of the family, probably spent more time with the president than anybody. He was his chief uh, aide, sat right outside the Oval Office. And this was after, uh, and I don't have the picture in here, but uh, uh, Mrs. Ford 
read the statement in the press room that uh, uh, the concession statement, and then President Ford walked around in the press room and shook hands with people. He wasn't blaming the press for the losing uh, election, and um, uh, but we walked back into the Oval Office, and um, just I and uh, and Terry O'Donnell and the president, and um, uh, the president who just conceded the election, uh, puts his arm around Terry, and he said, um, Terry, you know, you've, I don't think I've ever really thanked you for everything you've done for me, and if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Well, O'Donnell and I were just weeping. I was taking this picture through my tears, and uh, um, uh, I, I think it, it, again, underscores the kind of person he was. I mean, he was always thinking about other people. I mean, uh, just a, a really a selfless guy. And um, uh, I, I can't look at this picture without remembering exactly what happened. And uh, um, anyway, a flash forward to right before, uh, the day before the Fords were leaving the White House, and Mrs. Ford and I were walking around in the West Wing, and I'm taking pictures of her shaking uh, hands with people goodbye. Uh, and we walked by the cabinet room, which was empty. And this goes directly to the heart of your mother's sense of humor and um, uh, also her feminism. Uh, this, uh, uh, she, we walked by the empty cabinet room, and she looked at me and she said, you know, I've always wanted to dance on the cabinet room table. Now, the Secret Service guys who were along, and Eddie Adams, too, who couldn't shoot, yeah, but they thought she was joking. Uh, uh, sorry, Eddie. Uh, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, I knew she wasn't kidding, and she was a former Martha Graham dancer and very agile, and she took her shoes off, and she jumped up on the table, and I got this moment of her, and then she, when she, and she jumped off and kind of brushed her hands, and she said, "I think that'll do it for this place." But essentially, what she was doing, what she was doing, was planting like a female flag right in the middle of the cabinet room table. Uh, that uh, to that point, very few women had ever sat around that table as uh, uh, equals. Well, Carla Hills was second. Carla was uh, was one, and, but there were very few women ever. I mean, Carla was. Uh, the only one in uh, in the Ford administration, I, uh, but uh, it was rare. Mrs. Ford resented the fact that there weren't. Uh, it was a huge proponent of the ERA and uh, dragged your dad kicking and screaming down that road. But uh, he he went along with it. But um, this is who she was, and uh, um, and after that. Um, she was out of there. I mean, I don't know what to say. I had already left for college, so. Oh, really? I, I wasn't you there for this. Yeah, I missed out on this. It was not a happy time. I'm glad I left early. Yeah, and this is Susan and her dad after her dad died. This is in the White House. This is his official portrait. Um, uh, and, uh, you get invited back to go to the White House to see the portrait that they drape in black. So we as a family went back to see that. But to me, uh, uh, this picture with Susan, her dad, is a, a very special moment. It's a quiet moment. It's a discreet moment. This is not a press moment. Uh, part of my success uh, in this job was the fact that I, uh, um, I was, in fact, your dad said that my tombstone should read, here lies the worst source in Washington. I've, I just don't talk about it. You know, I let it, the pictures speak for themselves. I'm not, we're not taking the words down. I was a, a, not a, a source uh, at any point, not a leaker, uh, not whatever. I mean, I just, uh, I was so happy to be there. And I think, and I think you'll see it in the photographs as you go through the show that uh, um, those are pictures taken by somebody who is not obtrusive but uh, respectful, but also getting the moment, getting the picture, documenting the history. Um, and the final days, uh, I, I should, actually, maybe I'll find it uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, the letter, I, I, we all resigned as of January 20th at high noon. Uh, and um, um, 
1977 when Carter came in, uh, I had no interest in working for Jimmy Carter. Uh, uh, in fact, Jody Powell, his press secretary, was asked if uh, uh, there was going to be a, a White House photographer, and he said, no, we don't want another David Kennerly in the White House. I wear that as a badge of honor. Um, but I, I, the pictures are taken with respect, but also with an eye toward history. And when you go through it, well, I think what you'll see, and I uh, brought it up, uh, that uh, you're, you're seeing a, a portrait of humanity, a guy who not only loved his job and he became very good at being the president, but that uh, he cared about other people. And uh, that's there. And, I, and, and that was my message. I mean, this is, a, a, I feel, an honest translation of an honest man. And uh, and to me, that's the best I could do. Um, I think this is at the funeral, and uh, this is very difficult to do this, by the way, and certainly for Susan more than me. But uh, that's going up the house steps. Right, going up the house steps, and the house was, uh, as as he said, he he was a man of the house, and uh, went in in 1948. He was going to retire. Uh, before he was tapped to be the vice president. And um, why don't you talk a little bit about wh how your mom reacted when he said he was going to be the vice president after he pretty well promised they were going to retire and move somewhere else. Well, he, yeah. They, he had promised her that was his last congressional election and that he was going to retire. And so when he got the vice president, he said to her, he said, well, don't worry, Betty. Vice presidents don't do anything. <laughs> so... Um, you know, that kind of, between Dad and Dick Cheney, that proved pretty much true. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, yeah. but then Dad ran for, you know, the presidency, and then he really did promise her. He said, this will be the end. But she kind of won that battle by him not winning. So they got to um, go to California. I don't think that's what she had in mind. No, exactly. it's not what she had in mind. This is the photo I took from the, um, <clears throat> looking Sunday. down from the top of the Capitol Rotunda. And, um... You know, I, I, my job, uh, and this goes through the wars and like the personal relationships and the, um, everything I've had to look at, some good, some bad, and uh, um, sometimes I just feel really sad about what I do. And um, uh, like, but I still think it has to be done. I mean, I, I don't, um, and I, I, love other people's pictures and I, and I admire other people's work and uh, but sometimes it's just not fun and but I'm relentless about it and uh, to this day I still do it um, I'll end with this that I don't know Joe are we gonna have time for any questions or okay this is five presidents at the Ronald Reagan library opening the first time five presidents ever stood together we, did you go to that one um, President Bush, uh, who had been the vice president for Reagan. Reagan had beaten Carter. Carter had beaten Ford. Ford had replaced Nixon. These were, at that time, the five presidents that I had covered. And this was a Mount Rushmore kind of moment. Um, I got off to the side, and the picture was made when Reagan looked over toward us. And um, uh, that kind of sums up uh, why I'm in it, too. I mean, the, the, these, whether you love them or hate them or whatever, these are the people who are running the show, and those are the kind of people I want to photograph. So if it's for me, I'm not here. <laughs> okay. Maybe they need to go. Oh. <laughs> Give me two. Uh, maybe some questions. I, um, oh, you oh. got them. You got them. Got them. Okay. Direct them at Susan. I've like overdone it here. Joe had mentioned that uh, David had given you a camera uh, early on and encouraged you to take photographs uh, through this. And I think there's an Ansel Adams connection to this as well, perhaps. There, um, there is, but that camera was only on loan. He took it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a government camera. Probably was. <laughs> well, Oh, oh, uh, I think the audience would be interested in knowing a little bit about your um, career in photography. No, not really. Um, <laughs> it was short-lived. 
Um, David was very smart and um, truly handed me a camera and said, you know, this is historical. You need to document it. Not, and as I said, I was a senior in high school, and that really wasn't, I wasn't that interested in, in documenting anything but parties and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> but, um, but I did. And my senior project, um, because I went to Holton Arms, which is all girls school, we had a senior project for graduation, so we took the whole month of May off and got to do senior projects. So I decided to do my senior project on photographing my dad. And uh, I spent a... Senior, it? Yeah. It, it kind of was, but it, it, I didn't have to work real hard. <laughs> um, but I traveled with him. I basically followed David around for a month, which was very entertaining. Um, but we, we went on a couple of trips and did that sort of stuff. and. And then there was a gal in the photo office by the name of Sandy Isert, who was the, would you call her an editor? Yes. Okay. And so Sandy would sit down with me as my film would come back, and she would say, this is the mistakes you made, and this is good, and this is not good, and that sort of thing. And so, um, that, I mean, it was a great time. And I did it until the very end and when I left. And I continued my photography, um, worked for AP uh, for a while, and... Ladies Home Journal and did some a couple of movies and then I got married and pregnant and quit and that was the end of my career. <laughs> oh, that's abrupt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime we'll have to do the uh, Susan Ford show. No, they've all been destroyed. <laughs> all right, uh, David. A little bit of inside baseball because we've probably got some people out here who are um, photographers themselves. Um, uh, novices to uh, professionals. What did you shoot uh, in the White House? What, your cameras, your film? Um. Right, I, I shot um, with Nikons and uh, Leicas. And um, these days I'm using Canon digital products. But uh, uh, there, there's, uh, I think, a couple examples of the kind of cameras I used are in these display cases out there. In fact, uh, unfortunately, Sammy of Sammy's camera in Los Angeles is not here, but he loaned uh, the museum a, a Leica. But I used the Leica, all Tri-X, mainly black and white Tri-X film, rated at 800. Uh, the Leicas were quiet, so I, I used them in the Oval Office uh, mainly. And um, I had uh, some longer lenses with the, the Nikons, but... That's pretty much what I did. In Vietnam, I didn't use the Leicas. I, uh, I had uh, Nikons over there. and um, uh, But the Leica was a great camera because it's, a, it, it's discreet. And, um, uh, and I've always believed in simplicity. Uh, it's a, it's be I didn't carry a huge amount of gear. I still don't. I, I shoot fairly minimally, really. Um, and... Uh, don't believe that the more, more pictures you take, the better they're going to get. It's not true. Uh, and I'm asked all the time how many pictures to take to get a good one. It takes one. And so that's a really good rule to know. Uh, that doesn't mean I just take one frame and that's it. Uh, but I, one of the books I did was a, called Photo Du Jour, a picture a day in the year 2000, where I shot with a, a Mamiya camera, which is a uh, like a looks like a like on steroids it was a two and a quarter uh, using uh, 120 roll film really good quality uh, but I documented the turn of the uh, millennium with that and uh, that was a, a, a good project it almost broke up our marriage but uh, by the way son James my wife Rebecca are here and uh, James is a uh, junior at the University of California, Berkeley. No, that's not a conservative institution. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Rebecca and I are partners, uh, not only in life, but in business. And uh, uh, Rebecca has been responsible for guiding uh, our archive project uh, and making it really uh, something that's... Uh, uh, I'm not only proud of it, but it's going to 
make a big impact at some point, and mainly uh, not about how to take better pictures, but like history, 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 the three most important words uh, in my business. Do you have another one? Um, well, let's build on that just a little bit. Your most recent book was on iPhone uh, photography? Oh, yeah. Uh, David Hume Kennerly on the iPhone. It's still available out there, I believe. Uh, um, pictures shot all in uh, 2013 on, at that time, I think it was the iPhone 5. Um, but I think it's a good, uh, and Rebecca uh, has always asked me, like I said, why don't you talk about your process? And I said, well, it's nothing. I mean, I go and I take the pictures, you know, and uh, they come out usually, not always. Uh, and so she said, there's a hell of a lot more than that. And once I, I kind of got into thinking about it, if you could do it with the iPhone, and everybody's got the iPhone or Samsung, whatever you have, it's one of the greatest tools ever. And, and it's truly, you could make very good pictures with it. And, and so that book was about how to be a better photographer, not just a better, an iPhone photographer. The, to me, the iPhone is just a tool. And um, because I can carry it around with me, uh, uh, and I get asked all the time, wouldn't these pictures be better on your Canons? And I, I, I basically don't think they would exist unless they were on the iPhone because I don't carry my cameras around all the time. I mean, I've been carrying them around for over 50 years, you know, and they're heavy. And so, uh, it, but so for my pain day jobs, uh, I shoot with the Canons, but, and, uh, but for pleasure and satisfaction, I'm doing stuff with the iPhone. So if you look it up and want to get it, you can buy it online, but uh, uh, it will help you become a better photographer. Uh, not guaranteed, and you don't get your money back if it doesn't work, so. Well, let's, uh, let's give everybody an opportunity then to get out, to get some refreshments, go upstairs and see the remarkable exhibit uh, that you've put together. And uh, David, Susan, I want to thank you for uh, a wonderful evening um, with uh, the great stories. Um, that's what we all historians, uh, avocational and professional, live for. Thank you very much. Thank you.